Hello and welcome to History and Film. I'm Rich Simmons. Today we're discussing the Renaissance, and specifically the great artist Michelangelo. Even at the time that Richard III was being killed on the battlefield, the Renaissance was underway across Europe. We're told the Renaissance, which means rebirth, was the period where, after the Dark Ages, art and learning became important once again in Europe in a way that hadn't been seen since the glory days of Greece and Rome. And, I suppose if you're into gross oversimplifications, that's pretty close. I do seem to have majored in gross oversimplifications, but let's see if we can find a little nuance. Historians today seem to shy away from the distinct labeling brought on during the 19th century. I've mentioned before how they don't really use the term Dark Ages anymore, and even saying there was this period called the Renaissance implies something with a distinct beginning and end that we can point to. I think the biggest theme that has emerged from this project is that history doesn't do simple, and change happens slowly. Was your life or the world that much different yesterday than it is today? What about the day before that? Well, enough yesterdays ago, and you're headed to your first day of kindergarten. Even more, and we're at the American Civil War, the birth of Charlemagne, the first time man built a fire from scratch. It's always creeping forward, just one day at a time. The Renaissance centers on the idea of humanism, that humans have control over their lives and that critical thinking and evidence are important and that they trump superstition. We can engage with each other to create better lives. Contrast this with the so-called Dark Ages, with the plague and superstition and man just struggling to survive. Critical thinking skills weren't a luxury that one had time for. This newer view thrived first largely in Italy, Again, keeping in mind that this is for Europe. We met Ibn Sina in Persia more than 400 years before today's story. It was seen not just in art and architecture, but in politics and science. The printing press emerged in what is now Germany during the reign of Henry VI in England, just to place everything in our timeline here. If we're really going to try to narrow down the beginning of the Renaissance, it was in Florence, Italy in the 14th century where the ruling Medici family put their financial resources behind the promotion and creation of art and artists. So, today, in the modern world, we rightfully see the present as the time with the most available knowledge. Whether we use it or not is a different story, but it's there. A lot of our popular culture involves stories where some apocalyptic event casts us into a world where that is no longer the case. Where in the year 2100 and we're living in the woods and talking about the days when man had machines that could communicate across the world instantly. Well, that's kind of how medieval Europe viewed classical Rome and Greece. There were technological achievements that modern man at the time had lost the knowledge of. They lived amongst the ruins of a civilization greater than their own in many ways and they knew it. A couple notes from my trip to Florence in 2010. So, my source here is just my memory and whatever guide I heard it from, but it it fits our narrative here. When the dome of the cathedral in Florence was built, it was the first dome built by man, at least in this part of the world, for a thousand years. Again, the technology had been lost and had to be rediscovered. Also, I was told that a contest was held to decorate the door of another church and that the contest, with its focus on art and creativity, could be considered the beginning of the Renaissance. So, who were the Medici? Basically, they were a family of merchants that gradually grew in wealth and power. From humble origins, by the 15th century, their bank was the largest in Europe. In 1469, Lorenzo de' Medici became Lord of Florence and sponsored such artists as Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci. It was into this world that Michelangelo Bonarotti was born in 1475. It so happens that marble quarries are in this region, and Michelangelo was familiar with the substance from his earliest days. He was basically a child prodigy. By the age of 13, he was already apprenticed to a prominent local artist, and at 14 was working as a professional. Indeed, some of Michelangelo's works that survive to this day were done when he was a teenager. He even lived with the Medici family for about five years until the death of Lorenzo. He was just 24 when he completed his famous Pietà out of marble that resides today at the Vatican. And I didn't know it until I went to Italy, but a Pietà is a depiction of Mary holding the dead body of Jesus. 
and his most famous statue of David was completed before Michelangelo was 30. It was actually a project that had been started 40 years earlier by another artist. He basically just spent his whole life taking commissions and doing mind-blowing work. Shortly after finishing up David in Florence, Pope Julius II invited Michelangelo to Rome to build his tomb. And this is where our movie today begins. Michelangelo is played by Charlton Heston, and Rex Harrison plays Pope Julius II. On our list of movies so far, we previously saw Rex as Julius Caesar in Cleopatra. And the Pope here kind of threw me for a loop. We, we don't just get the head of the Catholic Church, we get what amounts to a warrior king with Julius II wearing armor and leading troops in a battle uh, to protect the interests of the church. He even has a line in the film to the effect of, if I had not become a conqueror, there would be no hope for peace for mankind. We'll get more into his life after recapping the movie, but I needed to mention that up front. The Pope tells Michelangelo that he needs to put the tomb on hold, and his next task is to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Vatican is undergoing renovations at this time, and they want to keep its current structure and just give this prominent chapel a nice mural around the sides, basically just the base of the rounded ceiling where it meets the walls. Michelangelo tells the Pope that he's a sculptor, not a painter. It would be a waste of his time and talents. And the Pope basically says, I wasn't asking. At a party, Michelangelo talks with a couple of his friends from Florence. Indeed, they are a son and daughter of Lorenzo de' Medici. The son is a cardinal for the church, and though the movie doesn't mention it, he later will become Pope Leo X. The daughter and Michelangelo seem pretty close, and the film subtly implies a romantic past between the two, but that seems to be invented. She doesn't show up in any of my research on Michelangelo, and this is as good a time as any to discuss Michelangelo's sexuality. Like we've mentioned before with other historical figures, there's rarely a record on things like sexuality. If a man was a womanizer, that may come down to us as it was half expected and allowed. There does seem to be a decent chance that Michelangelo was gay and later had a decades-long relationship with another man, though many also believe this relationship was never consummated and that Michelangelo, whether gay or not, may have remained celibate his whole life. As a movie from 1965, especially one starring conservative Charlton Heston, the agony and the ecstasy just chooses not to go there. There are some subtle hints when Michelangelo talks about his calling to art and creation that comes from God and that starting a family is just something he's never felt compelled to do. After some initial work on the project, Michelangelo is just bored and frustrated and runs off. He goes back to work in the marble quarries to hide from the Pope, but... While he's there, inspiration finally strikes him, and he stares up at the cloud and imagines a vision for the ceiling far more ambitious than anything the Pope was re requesting. It's kind of a funny scene, because Michelangelo is captured and brought before the Pope just as they're getting ready to go into a battle. So, while they're surrounded by soldiers, Michelangelo lays his sketches down on the ground, and he and the Pope, in battle armor, are discussing art design, and, and artillery shells start coming in, and the soldiers are nervously awaiting instructions from the now-distracted Pope. So now, Michelangelo is motivated, simply because it's finally become a challenge, not the simple, boring art the Pope asked for. The Pope even tells one of his men, I planned a ceiling. He plans a miracle. The rest of the film is just the immense task of painting the ceiling while under pressure to finish in a timely manner. The Pope constantly asks, when will you make an end? With Michelangelo always replying, when I'm finished. And we constantly see the physical toll the project is taking on Michelangelo. He collapses from exhaustion at one point. The guy was basically a workaholic. And his Medici friend worries he's going to work himself to death. We get a cameo from the artist Raphael, whom the Pope teases he will replace Michelangelo with if he's unable to continue. The idea of someone else finishing his work is unacceptable to Michelangelo and is the crack of the whip he needs to get back to work. The Pope is very tough on Michelangelo, and Michelangelo in turn is pretty impudent with the Pope. They're kind of friends, but they also seem to resent each other. Michelangelo both quits and gets fired from the project after the Pope shows off the work before it's finished. Michelangelo is furious that any incomplete work of his would be shown, and the Pope is basically the king here and does what he wants and is tired of Michelangelo always talking back. In reality, it did take Michelangelo four years to finish painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, though the movie implies that it's much longer and even shows Pope Julius II significantly aged by the end of the film. Though he had health issues at the time and did die just a year after the ceiling was completed, 
though they don't get to that in the film. After the sealing, Michelangelo is tasked with finally finishing the Pope's tomb. All told, both before and after the events of the film, Michelangelo spent 40 years working on the tomb of Pope Julius II. Michelangelo continued working for the rest of his life. He was about 37 when the Sistine Chapel ceiling was finished, but was in his early 70s when he was later named architect of St. Peter's Basilica. The project had been ongoing for 50 years, and indeed we even saw its foundations being laid in the background during the movie. Michelangelo lived to be nearly 89 years old and was sculpting right down to the final week of his life, a true genius and inspiration. The title of the film refers simply to both the suffering that an artist such as Michelangelo goes through when creating his works and the satisfaction and glory he receives upon their completion, the agony and the ecstasy. So most of you know the iconic centerpiece from the Sistine Chapel ceiling, even if you don't actually know that's what it's from. God reaching out his hand toward a naked Adam who has his own hand stretched out toward God. The full scope of the ceiling is 500 square meters of ceiling with over 300 figures. The goal was actually to tell a story with the murals, creation, the Garden of Eden, man's fall, Noah, etc. I was there in 2010 and it is quite the experience. You're not supposed to talk, but there are still constant echoes of hushed whispers and photography is not allowed. So there are a dozen Italian security guards milling about making sure no one is sneaking a shot with their camera. Likewise, his marble statues are amazing. They, they simply don't look like stone, especially when you look at, say, the arm of the Statue of David. It looks like gray flesh and even has veins visible on it. It's crazy. Now, let's talk briefly about Pope Julius II, which is actually a hard thing to do briefly because his life could easily be the subject of the next HBO series. He was born Giuliano de la Rovere from a poor family with noble roots He had connections from an early age to the Medicis and to the church, but his interest in the church seems to have had little to do with religion and more to do with all the political games going on with it. His uncle became Pope when Giuliano was 28 years old, and this led to the young man being appointed to positions within the church he had no right otherwise to receive. It's easy to see why a generation later, Martin Luther was so frustrated with the corruption in the church. God seems to have had little to do with the structure of the Catholic Church at the time. Giuliano was heavily involved in political negotiations with rulers of European countries. All the alliances and military campaigns are just too complicated for us to get into here. When a new pope came to power when Giuliano was 40 years old, he became the pope's right-hand man and may have been the true power behind the Holy See. Again, researching this just yields more dense politicking than I care to get into here. Coups and treaties, wars, etc., When Giuliano was 49, the papacy became open again, but a rival family to the Medici, the Borgia, swooped in and secured the Vatican for themselves. Giuliano was now on the political outs with the church and made his own alliances with France, and together they invaded Rome with the French army. Again, too much to get into, but I just wanted to give you a sense of who this man was. Just before his 60th birthday, Giuliano finally became Pope Julius II, and he very much viewed himself as another Caesar in charge of Rome. He was the Pope who established the Swiss Guard, which still, at least ornamentally, guard the Pope today. It was just two years after his ascension to the papacy that Julius called the famed Michelangelo to Rome to work on his tomb and the rest we saw in the film. The Agony and the Ecstasy was nominated for five Academy Awards, though all just in the technical categories. It has an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes. Elsewhere in the world around this time, Martin Luther will nail his 95 Theses to a church door just five years after the completion of Michelangelo's magnificent ceiling. The same year Michelangelo finished it, uh, Copernicus declared the sun was the center of the solar system. The year after that, Machiavelli wrote The Prince, basically suggested directions for the Medici family. We're really now getting to the point in history where there are just so many more names and events that are familiar. Columbus sailed to the Americas when Michelangelo was a teenager. The whole world is about to bust wide open, though we're going to stay in Europe for another couple weeks. One more tidbit about our warrior pope from today's film. When an English king needed special permission from the pope to marry his brother's widow, it was Pope Julius II who gave him the all clear. That king was Henry VIII, who we will see next week trying to divorce himself from that same marriage in the 1966 Oscar winner for Best Picture, A Man for All Seasons. (laughs) 